I thank you for your presence and thank you for the opportunity to preach uh, to you once again. And I'm glad that uh, Mark said uh, the word, the secret word now. The past word, as always, going to be what? What? Bodacious. Come on. Good gracious. Alive. You know? But it, it's just absolutely now. We've been, like a st- the stressful times we've gone through and are going through uh, COVID-19 and and they've uh, invited every one of us to get a uh, shot or two and uh, to see how that works. Uh, some of you have gotten it and some of you have not and I'm one of the have-nots. Right now I had made up my mind so uh, we're just going to go right along with it at but uh, to see the things have changed. Just uh, looking at it, uh, you know, if, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but the, the attitude of people has changed. Uh, they, they, there's that, uh, that seeming like that attitude of uh, uh, fear has crept into our life. And, and you go somewhere and uh, you don't want to uh, go anywhere at all. And uh, so uh, you, you, the schools have closed, the businesses have closed down or sh- shut down a little bit. Then you, you're wearing the mask, and we're uh, getting uh, sort of used to that. Uh, six feet apart, and in the, uh, uh, the uh, mask and the six feet apart to, to get uh, people together or to uh, stray, stray out and to stay out out there. And then to uh, staying in, uh, uh, I stayed in. Uh, I had uh, COVID one time, and uh, on December the 14th, I was uh, con- uh, talked, uh, con- told I was had a uh, uh, virus. So I quarantined myself for 10 days, and you know what? Carolyn got it also, and so she, we were quarantined together. Now, how how about that? Huh? Lucky Carolyn. Bad Bradley. Huh? So so it makes it, you know, it, it makes a makes a difference. And then the question of how we're going to handle this. And so uh we we just uh have trusted God and we'll continue on trust. And by the way, God is in control. He is in control. He knows what's going on, and he knows what the end uh, result's going to be. But is, is, you think he's uh, trying to teach us a lesson and trying to get our minds on him and on his word and his actions and what he wants us to do? That's, uh, I've always wondered about that. But then, then I, I was, was looking, and I... I think, well, what is the church? Uh, and so I, I chose to use the uh, scripture, Matthew chapter 16 and verses 13 through 19. And that uh, Jesus is coming into Caesarea Philippi and he asked his, uh, his disciples some questions. And the question is, who do men say that I am? Now, what, what are you hearing? Friends of mine, what are you hearing about me? What are people saying about me? And then, then uh, Peter comes up and, and he says uh, in verse uh, 14, uh, he says there that, uh, let me find my verse here. Uh, Simon Peter says, uh, he asked the question, uh, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. Thou art the anointed one of God. You are the chosen one of God. You are the one that God has chosen to come into this world to suffer, to bleed, and to die and after being born of a virgin to spend your time on the earth 33 years, a little bit longer, and to be in public ministry For three and a half years. Now he is the one. 
That's what basically is what is being said. You have gone, come into this world to uh, be a person that will live a perfect life and really be involved in the work. And so here it is that we see that uh, Simon Peter answers that. And notice what Jesus says there. He says in verse 17, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father which is now. All of this, Simon Peter, all of this now, that my heavenly Father has sent it to you and you have spoken rightly. You see, God is in control there. And so, uh, my Father which is in heaven has given it to you. But, now notice what Jesus said. But I say unto you also that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. The rock of faith that Peter demonstrated there and, and answered it. Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christ. And there the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It seems like that, that everywhere we go that there are things that are going against what God wants them to do. There is the matter of uh, just being a uh, something that is uh, contrary to God's idea and to God's thoughts. And then, then to see that we know what is the church. Well, the church is the ecclesia. That simply means the one who is called out. Now, every one of us who uh, knows Jesus as our personal Savior, that we have been called out. God called us. You remember the time that God called you whenever you were lost, doomed, on the road to hell and destruction, that God said, look to Jesus, my son. And you did, and he came into your life. You were called out from a world of sin and damnation unto a life that was life and spiritual, and abundantly clear as to what should happen. All right, then, then that, that question is, uh, what is the church? What is the New Testament church that we, we are? Is it the building? You look around and see how wonderful, I remember whenever this church building was built, and how I saw it go up. And I remember the, the time that people came together here in worshiping of God and to seeing people come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and to see boys and girls like myself walk the aisle to give my life and their life to Jesus and to hear him writing by name and their name down on the book of life to see how God works in mysterious ways His wonders to perform. But it's not the building, it's not the Sunday school class, it's not uh, the choir or uh, any other thing. It's you and I together being a part of the family of God. Now that's the church. And uh, as you live your life, what is it like? Is it one that is pleasing to God? Is it one that people can see in your life Jesus Christ coming out of you? There is that fulfillment of the vision of God, of the church. Uh, are we coming to church to understand what is going on and to see what is going on? Are we looking at the mission of the church? What is the mission of the church? Well, I think that if we look at it, that we see that Mark 16, 15 says that to go out into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost 
and to save those people. That's the mission of the church. Are we following the mission of the church? Are we doing the mission of the church? Are we going out into the highways and the hedges and and compelling them to come in to the house of God? Why? That my house may be filled and they may hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to keep focus on our mission as a church. Every one of us, God has called and He has a plan for your life. We might find it in, uh, uh, early in our life or it may be in the middle life or it may be in the senior years of our life. But we find that, we recognize that it is God's will that we be doing this. You know, uh, we have that idea of keeping focused on our mission. Then that to see that we come together. As I've said, and, and I, I'm going to think, I think I'm going to do this now. I'm not sure, but I think I'm going to do it. I know I'll be coming to the 11 o'clock service. And I'm going to come to the, the 9 o'clock service and I'm going to listen to that fellow preach twice. Because I miss being with those people that come into the 9 o'clock service. It seems like it's been a million years since we've been together as a congregation, as a church there. And we need to, to come together for fellowship. You know, there's nothing any more enjoyable than to get together with your family, your personal family, and just sit around and talk and enjoy each other and talk about this and talk about that and talk about this and talk about that. Just to enjoy the fellowship. The same thing holds true with a church family. Is that we need to have that fellowship that we bond together and have it so that we can be together in doing the work that God has called us to do. To be able to share that. To see that we have the, not only the fellowship, but we have the programs that need to be instilled, involved, and in, in, in place in order to get what the people need out. Sunday school, uh, the youth choir, the, I mean the youth program, the uh, children's program, all of that, all of that comes together. We are all family. Do we understand that? Then to, to see how many times that we have uh, been able to uh, win somebody to Jesus. You know, it, it's, a, it's the greatest joy in the world to win somebody to Jesus. After I was saved and I was up in the balcony up there one night with my two friends, Peanut and Jim. And I had already been saved, and, and I could see that both of those boys, friends of mine, they were going from one foot to the other, just, just you know, just shaking like that. And I looked at uh, Jim, I said, Jim, is God dealing with you? Is he asking you to become a part of his family? And he said, yes. I said, well, all you've got to do, Jimmy, is to go down the aisle here and come to the preacher and tell Brother Gerard that you want to be saved, that God is speaking to you. He did that. And then, you know, I just began to bubble up there. And then the Peanut, he looked at me, and he, or I looked at him and I said, you want to do the same thing? He said, yes. I said, well, just believe, trust in God. And let him direct you in your life. That old peanut started down the aisle. Come to know Jesus. Now, brother, if you don't believe that'll that'll set a a bunch of wet wood on fire, you just do it. You find somebody that has never accepted Jesus Christ 
as their personal Savior and you witness to them and they come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that is what it's all about. I taught a Sunday school class at Airline and there was this young man in there that, that uh, uh, I did not know where he was saved. Not, but I just felt inclined to that morning to preach uh, to teach on the the uh, matter of salvation, and I talked to him and I talked to him and he he didn't respond. But thank God that in the service that morning, that service, he came forward and accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. You know what he said to me, and I guess there's a lot of Jimmys out there like this, he said, Cigar, that's my nickname, I would not have known if you hadn't told me. Now my question here, how many people that you've rubbed shoulders with and that you are associated with that do not know Jesus Christ as personal Savior that you witness to? Hmm? Who does the church belong to? Some might think it belongs to the preachers, the deacons, uh, the staff members, or, or whatever. But it doesn't. In the matter of verse 18 there, it says, And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my... Know that? My? That's a personal pronoun in case you didn't know. My church. My ones that I call. My ones that are coming to know uh, me as personal. I'm going to build my church. And notice what it says. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Nothing is going to claim the church of the living God. Because it is, belongs to Him. And it, we have the responsibility just like the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, that we have this responsibility. Let a man, let some, those that you come in contact with, those uh, that you associate with, let a man so account of us, of us. They see our life and they know whether or not we've been saved. And I remember the first sermon that I ever preached as I, I announced my call to preach was on the fact that the life that I now live, people are going to be looking at me and they're going to be looking at you and see if you are living the life of Jesus Christ. As ministers of the Christ and the stewards of the mysteries of God. People want to know what's going on in our life. So the mission is to share the gospel. The mission is to preach the word. See, the message that is to be preached is our uh, acts. Go out into, I mean Mark uh, chapter uh, 16 verse 50. Go out into the world. It's preaching repentance, preaching remission of sin, to see that, and I've heard this before, that people have said, I've been so bad that God will not forgive me. Wrong. God will forgive you no matter what you have done or where you have been, anything else that is contrary to God's law and God's way and God's will. He will forgive you if you will ask Him. He will do that. Now, we need to understand the church, what the church should do. And that is to have an attitude of repentance. You know, every Sunday, every Sunday, we ought to come into this sanctuary and, and we ought to have an attitude of asking God to forgive me. Asking Him to work in my life. Asking Him to show me someone that needs to be saved. 
And to be able to work like that. And to understand repentance. But then also, he comes in, and I thank God for this uh, trait that uh, is here at New Holland. And that is to love. Love everybody. You know that old, uh, make, the old time religion? You remember we singing that? Makes me love everybody. Huh? That's what it is. You love them. You love on them. You tell them that you love them. How long has it been since you told someone that it, you love them? Huh? How long has it been since you told your spouse you love them? Huh? That's something other that we need to understand and to do is to share our love because God's word says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 that God is love. Now that is the highest uh, love that you can have is God's love. And then to see not only to have repentance and love, but to have a, a vision of what is God's will for my life. Where am I supposed to go? But refuse to be distracted. If you're not careful, folks, now we understand that Satan will seek to go to and fro on the face of this earth, seeking whom he may devour. Let me say, seeking whom he may distract from following God. He will do that. Now, a good, good example of that is Nehemiah. In chapter, Nehemiah, uh, chapter 2 of Nehemiah, in verse 10, there was a building of the wall, and three people in that, uh, uh, Jews, that came to Nehemiah and wanted him to come down from the building of the wall. Nehemiah knew that God wanted him to build the wall and he surveyed it. And then eventually they went three times and Nehemiah sent the word back. I have work to do. I have work to do. And then he finally said it of a great and impre impressed them upon them that there is a great work to be done here. Now, folks, let me emphasize to you that there is a great work to be done here in this community, here in this city, in this county, in this state, in all the world. There's a great work to be done. And God didn't save anyone to sit down on the stool of do-nothing. Nehemiah could have said, God, hey, you know... I, I understand what you want me to do, but I can't do it, I won't do it, whatever. See, we, we need to refuse to quit. Don't quit. And then to see that we need to strive as a church. And what do we do that? We don't lament about what has happened, the attendances or the the opportunity of sharing, but we need to think about what God wants us to do. Keep aiming for excellency in the church and what the church does and is doing. And then to see that the gospel is the only message clear-eyed enough to tell the truth about human nature and to offer a hope and redemption. Hope and redemption there. I'm going to close with this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. And I'm going to do as Paul did, admonish the church at Corinth. I'm going to admonish you as members of the New Holland Baptist Church. I'm going to admonish you to do this. Now listen carefully. You got your ears open spiritually? Huh? This means yes. This means no. Some of you have, some of you haven't, and some of you evidently are not going to do it. All right, anyway, um, here is what Paul says to the church at Corinth. Therefore, my beloved brethren, therefore my ones that have been saved by the grace of God, who have walked the aisle of forgiveness and talked about it, 
Be steadfast. That is strong. Don't move. Unmovable. Unmoved. Don't be swayed by every flow of doctrine that comes your way. Uh, just hold on. Hold on. Hold on to Jesus Christ. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, don't get the idea that you are not doing the work and you're going to quit and you're going to give up because that is not what God wants us to do. He wants us to hold on, to keep on holding on. I remember uh, uh, Bum Phillips, who was a, uh, co uh, the professional football coach at uh, uh, Houston Oilers, and he said, I want players that if I'm about to fall over the bank, I want players holding the rope that will pull me up, to pull me up out of that. Myry pit of sin. And that's what Jesus Christ will do for each and every one. That is to hold on and to pull you up out of the miry pit of sin. How about your life this morning? What is it like? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as personal Savior? I dare say that most of us have, if not all of us. But then, where are the other people? See, New Holland has a church role, a church membership of 411 people. Could we get all of them in here? Doubt very seriously. But what we got, about 25% of the membership is here. Sunday school, Sunday morning, and then whenever we had Sunday night, less than that, but in the Wednesday night, to work at it, to see God working in the light of his work and mission that we have. So what is your mission? Have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? Then you come if you have, if not. You come. And we're going to sing an invitation. Oh, by the way, come on, Mark. Come on. Come on. By the way, you may be here and you've been saved, but you're not doing what Jesus wants you to do, what God wants you to do. Then you come and make that commitment today and to share Jesus with others. And if you do that, then we will be greatly rejoicing in the presence of God.